In this new model on entire derivatives and indefinite integrals, we're going to start with basic definitions and properties. So an entire derivative of a function f on a given interval i is another function, say capital F, whose derivative is equal to the function f for all x in the interval i. So in some sense, it's going in the reverse direction compared with what we have done so far. So far, uh, we were studying the properties of a given function by looking at, among other things, uh, the behavior of its derivatives. First derivative, second derivative, and so on. In this case, given a function, we're looking for another function whose derivative is a given function. So you may ask, why do we care to find that? In many situations, it is useful to find entire derivatives of a given function. Uh, for instance, to know the position of a particle at a given time, knowing its velocity, right? If you have the velocity, it is the rate of change of the position. So if you know the velocity, finding an entire derivative corresponds to finding uh, essentially the position function. Now, let's look at some most basic examples. For instance, we want the entire derivative on the real line of the function x. Well, you might start with um, remembering that the derivative of x squared is 2x. So it's not quite what we want, but almost. Right? We get the derivative 2x instead of x. So all we need to do is add just a constant. Specifically, if I pick the function x squared over 2, when I differentiate that, I get 1 half of the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, so I get x. So in other words, x squared over 2 is an antiderivative of the function x, on the real line. The natural question is, is it the only one? Is it the only choice to find an antiderivative of x? Well, something you can immediately observe is that if I add a constant, for instance, I get x squared over 2 plus 4. When I differentiate that, I'm going to get the derivative of x squared over 2, so x, and then the derivative of 4, which is 0. And of course, 4 can be replaced by any other constant, for instance, x squared over 2 minus 3. Or in general, if um, capital F is an antiderivative of little f on a certain interval, when I add any constant to that antiderivative, you see that when I differentiate, I'm going to get the same derivative, therefore little f, for any constant. So if I have 1, antiderivative, adding an arbitrary constant gives me another one, which means that when a function has antiderivatives, it has infinitely many, at least one for each constant. But fortunately, we only need to find one, because if we have one antiderivative of the function f on a certain interval, then any other antiderivative of that function on that interval is of the form, the one that we have, plus a constant. So we already know that if I have one antiderivative and I add a constant, I get another one. Now all we need to see to prove this theorem is that if I take two different antiderivatives of the function little f, then they differ only by a constant. And to see that, if I start with capital F and capital G, two antiderivatives of f, that means their derivatives, capital F prime and capital G prime are equal, and therefore, the difference, f prime minus g prime, or capital F prime minus g prime, is zero. And I can interpret that as the derivative of the function capital G minus capital F is zero on the interval. But we have seen when we were talking about the uh, mean value CRM, and also when we were talking about intervals of increase and decrease and so on, that if you have a function whose derivative is zero on an interval, then that function is constant on the interval. So that means the function capital G minus capital F is constant on the interval i. In other words, G is really just f of x plus k for some constant k on that interval. Now, we can interpret some of the basic rules of differentiation in terms of antiderivatives. Try to interpret what it means for antiderivatives. One of the most basic tools in differentiating function is a power rule. That says that if I differentiate a power of the variable, I can take this power in front and then multiply by x to the 
um, n-1 where n is the original power. So if we turn that around in terms of trying to find what function has a property that its derivative is x to the n, right? so instead of differentiating x to the n, you want to find an antiderivative of x to the n, well, you, you can turn it around. So if you start with x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, and you differentiate that, applying the power all above, you see that you get 1 over n plus 1, this constant in front, and then derivative of x to the n plus 1, which is n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 minus 1. The n plus 1 over n plus 1 cancels out. In the power, we just get n, so we end up with just x to the n. In other words, on tau derivatives of x to the n on the real line, um, well, assuming that um, x to the n is defined on the real line, are of the form x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 up to a constant k. This is true for certainly for any positive n, uh, but more generally, as long as this makes sense, that is, for any n that is not negative 1. Of course, if n is negative 1, we would divide by 0 in this formula. Moving to other formulas on derivatives and try to interpret it in terms of antiderivatives, we know that the derivative of sine x is cosine x, and the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. In terms of antiderivatives, it means that the antiderivatives of cosine x are of the form sine x plus k, because the derivative of sine x is cosine x, and antiderivatives of sine x are of the form negative cosine up to a constant. Why negative cosine? Because if I differentiate cosine, I get the opposite of sine x, so I need to multiply that by negative 1 in order to get a derivative equal to sine x and not negative sine x. Among the standard formulas for derivatives, we have this constant multiple rule. That is, if I multiply a function by a constant and differentiate that, I obtain the derivative of the function multiplied by the constant. If we turn that around, that means that if capital F is an antiderivative of a given function f, then when I multiply this antiderivative by a constant, I get an antiderivative of c times f. Right? Simply because if I differentiate c capital F, I get c derivative of capital F, so that's c little f. Similarly, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, and therefore, if capital F is an antiderivative of little f, and capital G an antiderivative of little g, then capital F plus capital G is an antiderivative of f plus g. Again, if I differentiate capital F plus capital G, I get the sum of the derivatives, and that's little f plus little g. Now you see from the previous slide that stating the rules to find antiderivatives, or these rules that we have established by turning around the rules from differentiation, are pretty cumbersome to state. They're cumbersome to state because we don't have a practical notation to talk about antiderivative of a function. In the case of differentiation, we have a function f, and we have a notation for its derivative, either f prime or df over dx, this type of things. So to state the rules in a practical way for anti-differentiation, we need to introduce a practical notation. And here is a notation. We are going to use something very similar to the notation we used for definite integral. We're going to have an integral sign and then f of x dx to talk about the indefinite integral of f. And this is by definition the family of antiderivatives of f. Now of course here at this point it is quite mysterious why we would choose a notation that is so close to the notation of um, definite integral on an interval. The only difference is that there are no bounds of integration, no lower bound, no upper bound. Um, we will clarify in the next module why we use similar notations and why these two things are intimately related. So for now, we're going to use this integral notation, so integral sign followed by f of x dx, to denote the family of antiderivatives of f. So you can think of it as capital F plus k, where k is an arbitrary constant, and capital F is a specific antiderivative of f. In other words, the derivative of capital F is little f. So as I said, uh, this is called the indefinite integral of the function f. Now with this notation at hand, 
we can rephrase the rules that we went over in the previous slide. Namely, if I integrate a sum, this is the sum of the integrals. Right? In other words, antiderivative of the sum is the sum of the antiderivatives. If I integrate a constant multiple of a function, I can pull the constant out of the integral sign. And the power rule for antiderivatives is now stated that way. Integral of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 up to a constant. This is true for any n that is not negative 1. The integral of cosine x is sine x up to a constant, and the integral of sine x is negative cosine x up to a constant. Now, another rule that we can state is that the integral of secant squared is tangent x up to a constant. This is simply because the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Now, let's take a look at the power rule for antiderivatives. Uh, something I want to clarify is that in the case where x to the n is not defined on the real line, for instance, let's say we look at the integral of uh, 1 over x squared. So we are looking for an antiderivative of 1 over x squared. I can interpret it as antiderivative of x to the negative 2 and apply this power rule for antiderivatives. So n is negative 2, therefore n plus 1 is negative 2 plus 1, negative 1. So I get x to the negative 1 over negative 1 up to a constant. In other words, negative 1 over x up to a constant. That is not defined on the real line, but only uh, on an interval that does not contain 0. So this is valid only on an interval where it makes sense. In other words, either on the interval 0 infinity or on the interval negative infinity 0. And in general, very often for these integral formulas, that essentially give you antiderivatives. We are not going to specify the interval, but it is implicit that this is valid only on, on an interval where everything is well defined. Now turn to the next video to see more properties of these antiderivatives and indefinite integrals.